Haydi başlatıyorum. All right. Now I started the recording and I'm right now uh, starting the lecture. Uh, all right. Where have we uh, stopped uh, previously? We uh, we have seen a few uh, signal properties uh, regarding uh, whether they are symmetric, even or odd, or periodic, uh, etc. Now the periodicity um, or randomness and deterministic continuous time, discrete time. Yeah, th those were the uh, things that uh, we we have mentioned about. Uh, re regarding the the signals, now uh, periodicity is uh, one of the uh, re relatively important ones, and we have seen continuous time periodicity, uh, but we didn't mention about discrete time periodicity yet. And the continuous time periodicity is something uh, critical because if you add up a few periodic signals, that uh, in continuous time will uh, of course make another periodic signal. But what is the period of that periodic signal is uh, of importance. For example, what we said was um, if you have, for example, a, a periodic signal with this kind of a period, okay, up to here, and it makes, let's say, two oscillations up to, up to this point, of course, it's repeating. Uh, to the both sides. I'm just uh, giving you a few pe periods of this sinusoidal way, uh, looking waveform. And uh, another signal has a period uh, which is uh, two thirds of this one, let's say up to he here. So it makes, uh, let me use a different color. Uh, it makes one oscillation here and another oscillation here and a further oscillation here. So as you see, for one, the period was two thirds of the other one. So the eventual period is actually uh, from this point here up to this point here. So the overall, the effective T, the effective period, must be uh, calculated as uh, the least common multiple. Let's say the red uh, T period is two seconds, okay? And the black one's period is equal to three seconds. So what is the effective uh, period? As you see, after six seconds, they meet again at the same period instant or at the same signal uh, values. So the effective uh, peri period is six seconds. All right. This is how we do. We uh, have to use uh, the least common multiple of uh, the two periods that we are dealing with, this one and this one. Uh, the least common multiple is at least the multiplication of the two for uh, two real numbers. If, it, if one of them is two, if the other one is pi, for example, they have no uh, common multiples. Pi is irrational. If one of them is two, the other one is pi, then the uh, effective uh, period of the summation of two sinuses with a, a period of two and with a period of pi is two times pi, which is two pi. So real values uh, can at least be multiplied, and that would correspond to a period. But it's not the min uh, it may not be the minimum pe period. For the minimum pe period, you have to find the least common multiple. Now, um, for discrete time, however, the concept of period is a little bit uh, different, therefore a little bit um, more, more complicated. The difference is that for a periodic signal x of n, for an x of n to be periodic, in other words, it has to be periodic with uh, a period capital N or a period, an integer multiple of capital N, where this capital N is an element of integers. 
integer values, not real values. So a discrete time um, signal cannot be periodic with 2.1 or uh, 5.05 or pi or square root of two. It cannot be periodic with square root of two. It must be periodic with something integer because as we know, we have only uh, discrete slots for the discrete time signal. And uh, all the signal values must exactly appear on those time intervals, integer time intervals, on the integer axis of n. So when you shift, you must sh uh, make a shift of at least one, or you must shift by two. You cannot shift these things by 0 0.6. Okay, that's not possible. So this period of interest must be always an integer, which seems intuitive. You may say, fine, no problem, uh, I understand. But when I ask some um, questions, you, uh, this may cause uh, confusions in the students. For example, um, x of n is equal to cosine of okay, 10 n. It's a function and it's a cosine function. The question is, first of all, tell me if this is periodic or not. And uh, for the second question, if it is periodic, what is the period? The, the frequency is the same. If you have a period, two pi over that period is the frequency, both for continuous time and for discrete time. The, 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 uh, the representation of frequencies is the same. But the question now is, is it periodic? And if yes, what is the period? And therefore, what is the frequency? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Fatih Duanay says it, it, it is periodic. It seems periodic, right? Because it's a cosine. And that sounds very reasonable. But let's try to find the period then. How can we find the period? We can find the period this time from the frequency. The frequency, the angular frequency, is equal to 10, therefore, the period, let's say, we are trying to find it now as capital N, let's not notate it with capital T, okay? It's, you, it's reserved for continuous time. The period N is <clears throat> 2 pi over 10. And 2 pi is an irrational number, and that over 10 is not uh, an integer. So I have to find <clears throat> an integer, which is uh, an integer multiple of n. So it's, uh, this immediate n is not the period. It is certainly not the period. But can I find a period uh, by multiplying this capital N with an integer and then trying to get an integer, come up with an integer? And the answer is still no, because 2 pi or pi in general is irrational. It cannot be uh, written as something over something else, two integers, one integer over two, uh, another integer. Some, uh, some students may think, well, 22 over 7 seems to be uh, pi. No, 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 it's not pi. It's just an approximation. The real pi cannot be uh, obtained as a over b, where a and b are integers. So you can never, uh, this is not an element of integer, and no k times n for any k, any integer k, could be uh, an element of an integer space. This is also impossible. So we deduce that capital N is infinity. It does not exist. The period is infinity. If something is periodic with period infinity, then it means it's not periodic. So we, says, we say it's not periodic. It is surprising to come up with a result which is not periodic because it's a cosine. <laughs> but it's not periodic. So the situation can be, you can motivate yourselves about uh, what's happening here, like Sine or a cosine, uh, it's easier to draw a sign because it starts from the origin. Sorry about that, but it's the same. Something like this, right? And then 
I am sampling this to come up with uh, some points like this. And this sampled version, the discrete time version, the, the bars with some points on top of them, they never just be, behave exactly the same. They are all very slightly different. They correspond to sampling uh, the sine blob uh, at different amount of shifts and indefinitely different. They are just slightly moving. So you can never have exactly the same uh, segment, let's say from here to here, you never come up with exactly these values. These values just appear only once throughout the infinite extent of this n axis. They just never repeat. You cannot find exactly the same values anywhere on the axis. That, that's why it's not periodic. They are similar. You will find uh, the other uh, segment, sample segment, quite similar to that, but not precisely the same. So, technically speaking, Cosine tan n is not periodic. So what are periodic discrete time signals then? Can I come up with um, sinusoids, which will make uh, discrete time periodicity? And the answer is yes. They may look like this. X of n is equal to cosine 2 pi over uh, 7 n plus 1.2, for example. This is periodic, and it's uh, literally periodic. Because uh, of what? Because the, uh, the period is right here. This is capital N. That is, uh, because 2 pi over 2 pi over 7 is 7, and that is the period. This uh, 1.2 shift, it's just a phase doesn't matter, it's, it's applied to uh, throughout the signal, therefore uh, we don't care. Um, yeah, this is an interesting uh, phenomenon, but this is a periodic signal. Let me give you another example of another periodic signal. X of n is equal to 2 sine 2 pi over 7 n minus pi times cosine 2 pi over 8 n uh, minus uh, 3. Is the signal periodic is a question. Hocam, at, bir yeah. bölü 7 e, nasıl periodik oldu? Anlayamadım bunu. Uh, all right, Let, let's go back to that there then. Omega is equal to 2 pi over 7, isn't it? It's the, it's the angular frequency, which multiplies time. Because it's always in the form of cosine or sine, omega times t plus phase. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, any signal is cosine omega n plus phase. So omega is 2 pi over 7. Is this clear? Safe. Yeah. All right. If this is clear, then n is 2 pi over omega, which is 2 pi over 2 pi over 7, 7, and that is 7. Tamam, is şimdi. that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Şimdi. So, uh, regardless of that, anytime you see cos cosine 2 pi over something, that something is. Uh, the period candidate. And if it is an integer, then it means it is the period. Uh, so let's come back to our problem, uh, the, the newer question. Uh, 2 pi over 7 is one uh, angular frequency here, and um, 2 pi over 8 is another angular frequency of the other sinusoid. We don't care whether it's a sine or a cosine. We don't care about the phase shifts. We don't care about the scales of these sinusoids. One of them is 2, the other one is minus pi. But what is the period? First of all, they are individually periodic. Individually, the first period is 7, and the second period is 8. So what is the overall or effective 
period, it is the least common multiple of the two integer numbers. Previously, it was the least common multiple of two real numbers. Now, these are integer numbers. What is the least common multiple of seven and eight? It's the multiplication. There is, there is no common uh, denominator of seven or eight. They are uh, uh, co-prime to one another. In fact, seven is a prime number. So the effective uh, period is seven times eight, which is 56. So this summation or this signal is periodic with 56. Let's do other ex exercises. X of n is uh, 3 cosine, um, oops, excuse me, let me roll back. I want to do it's like pi over um, 4 n plus cosine pi over 3n. I'm trying to complicate uh, the cases a little bit. Okay, So I'm not giving it as 2 pi over something, but I'm giving it as pi over something. But that's fine. Uh, because the, the first period, n1, is uh, it must be found as uh, 2 pi over whatever it corresponds to. And according to that, it is 2 pi over what? It's 2 pi over 8. So n1 is 8. And similarly, this is, n2 is 2 pi over, if you write it that way, it is 2 pi over 6. Okay? Yeah. And then, uh, what is uh, the period? the effective period. Over here, 24. One of your friends, Salih Chan. Congratulations, because this was not an easy and immediate answer. Uh, uh, no, it's not 12, <laughs> it is 24. Because if you uh, check it, uh, it's always a good idea to check your final and eventual result. Uh, one of your friends said uh, 12. That that's, that's was a, a good idea. I mean, it's a smart, it was a smart move. Uh, because uh, the, the um, common denominator of 8 and 6 is 2. So let's divide, divide all of them by 2. And it, they become 4 and 3. And therefore, uh, 4 times 3 is 12. That, that looks uh, almost reasonable. But the problem is that 12 is not a multiple of 8, the first period. 8 is one period. It must be a multiple of it. Yes, 2 is a common denominator, but the least common multiple of 8 and 6 is 24. Because it is uh, 3 times 8 is 24. And uh, 4 times 6 is 24. So the least common multiple of 8 and 6 is 24. So we say the effective period is 24. That was the correct answer. 12 is not a period, unfortunately, because uh, the first signal uh, with a period 8 is not periodic with uh, 12. It is periodic with 24, however, because it's only three times the original period, which is also another period. So uh, you have to be careful about all these things regarding periodicity. Now I will um, open a new page and I will start uh, the signal interactions and the concept of systems. If you don't have any further questions. Is there any further question? Let me check. No. If you have any questions, you may open your mic and try to ask me as well. So let me now open a new page. So uh, signal interactions. And systems is the new uh, topic. The, these are the uh, sub chapters and uh, subsections uh, of the first chapter. 
okay, from the book by Oppenheim. Now, uh, maybe I should, uh, no, 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 I, I'm gonna come back to that uh, some, some time later, I'm just, uh, yeah, uh, I'll do that later. First, let's uh, see uh, what we can do with uh, signals and interacting with uh, some systems that we are aware of. And how can we uh, indicate those signals? We are going to, we, we still need uh, to uh, define a few very important signals. Uh, we haven't seen all types of signals yet uh, that we are going to use and use them as a notation throughout the course. An ex I will start with an example. It's, it may look awkward, but in a circuit, suppose that you have a voltage source like this, and it is uh, x of t. You, you pr probably prefer to use v of t as the voltage source, which is time varying, like this. And it is a, a simple RC circuit. So we have a resistor and a capacitor here connected to that and the observed output is the voltage throughout the capacitor like this from here to here as plus and minus and I'm gonna call that voltage to be uh, y of t and I will apply a particular a specific uh, input as x of t and that x of t signal I will draw and it's a rectangular box function, which starts at uh, zero and ends at a uh, time instant five seconds, let's say. So this is the input. Uh, or electronics, if you wish. Uh, you already know that um, the capacitor fills with the positive voltage. It uh, accumulates um, a, a voltage amount exponentially, okay, uh, until the saturation value, uh, until uh, the time instant. of five, so until five, the capacitor fills up like this exponentially. And uh, one is somewhere here, so it does not necessarily fill up to one because at infinity uh, it fills up, but it may uh, stop at a point ju just below one at uh, uh, time instant five, and then it decays afterwards. What? My wrist is causing problems, sorry about oh, it's doing it again. Hmm. So let me bring it here, excuse me for this, and it decays down to zero at infinity over time. So this was the behavior. Uh, of the output of y of t. Now, um, these are the things, I, I'm not going to solve it in terms of uh, circuit uh, knowledge. I, we know the solution, I'm assuming. Now, what I'm uh, trying to show you is uh, the notations that we are going to use and the notation that we can write x of t. One notation is this plot that I have drawn. You can just plot it, but I can ask you to write it uh, in an analytical form in several ways. And there are several ways of trying to write it in analytical forms. One analytical form of writing this is to use a piecewise uh, expression, piecewise mathematical expression, like it is one x of t I'm writing in the input between time zero and five, and it is zero elsewhere. This is one way of putting it. And using the similar uh, notation, 
I can write y of t is equal to uh, 1 minus a, an, an exponential like this between 0 and uh, 5. And it is uh, after 5, it is decaying starting from the point at uh, the value of uh, 5 with a uh, decay as I have written like this. Actually, I need to make it a little bit longer. So after 5, it's a decaying exponential in general, um, starting from uh, uh, a value uh, corresponding to 5. And of course, it was 0. Uh, th this is uh, t uh, greater than 5. And it was 0 uh, when t was uh, less than 0. So it covers all the time axis, this exp explanation or this kind of an expression. This is uh, an alternative way of writing it analytically. Using signal processing, there is a, a third way of writing this, and that is um, you, you can write as x of t is equal to u of t minus u of t minus 5. And probably the, the last one that I have written in dark blue if you can notice, it's not black, uh, is perhaps the, the newest one, which you're not very, you may not be very familiar with, because I'm using u of t as if it is a known signal, and indeed it is a known signal. It corresponds to uh, the unit step function. We will come back to that, but it's actually uh, zeros throughout negative time and suddenly it becomes one and stays at one. So u of t is this. So uh, if u of t, t is this, then u of t minus five, we know how to uh, change the free variable, right? We have uh, studied that before. This is u of t minus five, which starts at five on the time axis. So if you subtract the second one from the first one, you will come up with this rectangular box, which was the input. X of t is u of t minus u of t minus one, you see? So using one line only, without piecewise uh, making notations and things like that, it's very customary for people to use uh, u of t. Uh, in expression of the signals. For example, if a signal is uh, only right-hand sided, a, a sinus rate only to the right-hand side and to the left, it's let's say zero. So what you do is you say cosine or sine something times u of t. When you multiply with, with a, a u of t, the unit step, it immediately becomes one-sided. U of t is therefore a very beneficial uh, signal that you must be aware of and you uh, should better be using and learning how to use it. We'll come back to the uh, soon, uh, but um, right now we are only dealing with um, how it behaves. Or maybe, okay, I changed my mind. I, I, I will, uh, in, a, in a few minutes, I want to give you the definition of u of t. Be because this is important. u of t, the piecewise definition is like this. It is one when t is greater than zero and zero when t is less than zero. This is what u of t is. But well, how about uh, when t is equal to zero? When t is equal to zero, it's an infinitely small uh, time instant. Therefore, the value does not really matter and it doesn't change anything for multiplication purposes, for... Uh, uh, addition purposes, subtractions, etc. If a signal has a particular and isolated value at any given time instant, uh, that value does not uh, define the signal. It does not change anything because it's just an infinitely small uh, point. So at point zero, the definition of the or the value of the signal doesn't really matter. We don't care about that. 
And in the Oppenheim's book, it says, actually it's one. So it uses this. It is one when t is greater than or equal to zero. But uh, mathematically speaking, that, that is not correct. Although it doesn't really matter. But mathematically speaking, its value is essentially 0 0.5 when t is zero. So it's the in-between value. It's an interpolation value. That interpolation value I like better because it helps us uh, to make this unit step um, function or signal um, a limiting case of this signal. Suppose this is delta and this is minus delta, like this, okay? And this value is one. And as delta, uh, this is u, uh, sorry, it's u delta, u sub delta of t. And as uh, delta goes to zero, uh, u delta of t approaches to u of t. And as you see, this point, the intermediate point, let me mark it with a red, this intermediate point always remains to be 0 0.5, no matter how small delta can be. This is uh, how we can approximate the unit step function. This way of making an interpretation will help us to define another signal, but after the break. Now I will uh, stop the recording and I will stop uh, the lecture. We are going to meet at uh, 10 o'clock. Okay, at 10 o'clock we will start the second uh, meeting. We have to keep it a little bit short. Uh, for those of you who are having breakfast, uh, bon appetit. Uh, but for those of you who are uh, carefully listening to the course, you may go grab some tea and uh, have some further breakfast if you wish. So right now, uh, meanwhile, uh, you can also accumulate your uh, questions. If you have any questions, keep, uh, collect your questions. You can ask me when we start at 10 o'clock. So now I'm stopping the recording.